Full sail. Full sail. Greeting, greeting. Wave the great feather. The upright feather is the sun of our spiritual universe. So that begins my theme today is the sun and also the summer solstice. So if you can go up here to the top, this is my portrait of her, the sun. And looking at her, this is from Mexico. Our beautiful songs come from the other world, from the house of the sun in heaven. Only from her house come the many flowers, the giver of life. She seeks them for herself. Red flowers, green flowers spilling over. She dances on the flowers. She is joyful. The blossoming water flows while amid emerald flowers. The green black thrush sings with a song so intoxicating. The sun, she mingles with the flowers weaves in and out among them. Within she sings, alone, the beautiful blue bird. Then we come right down to this. This is my drawing. Yeah, well, here's the bird. Got the bird in there. <laughs> and then this is my drawing for the summer solstice. And that's one I very much, very much like. You got that in there. <laughs> and with the summer solstice, we're going to go over here to my display here. This is called the uh, Stone of Bell, or the Bell Stone. <clears throat> I have been showing this for many, many years. I've made a few different renditions of this. This one I did particularly for the summer. <clears throat> and uh, it is located in Nevada on the Truckee River, uh, I don't know, a few miles east of Sparks, in an area that was a huge uh, rock outcrop from the side of a hill that was known as the Court of Antiquity because it is covered with many ancient petroglyphs. And this particular stone, you know, stands, you know, to the west of that huge outcrop, all by itself, a singular stone, no other like it, and it is emerging from the earth. And it's about uh, about five feet high, you know, higher higher than my picture here, you know, about this high, and it is inscribed in Celtic in the Gaelic language. And it is about uh, the sun coming over the stone and then during the year it goes into the shadow until uh, the winter solstice when it begins to uncover again in the light until today it is completely in the light. And that would be the glory of Bell. And its features is, uh, it's all made of crystalline granite and uh, it has a perfect bowl in the top, maybe a gallon or two of water it could hold, like that. And on the lip, here was a very neat engraving into the rock, uh, just the way I made it there, um, from the alphabet of the Celtic Iberians. Uh, the whole thing says, Ya, Hu, Bel. <clears throat> so, Ya is a diphthong in this writing system. Um, so you can read it just as Yahoo, which would mean exalted is the moon. So this letter C uh, stands for, in this culture, Kalman. Kalman means, you know, the dove. And the dove is known to be the queen of the moon. And the moon is known to govern the solar year. Here in Native America, we always spoke of moons, how many moons, like that. And this inscription, like this, is in the Oga, and that's, you know, the B and the L for 
Bell. So, Bell is a solar divinity in a sense. Uh, he's very, very ancient throughout the um, ancient world, and uh, you know, could blossom, you know, as a sun god. He is also more the Maxabul of Gren. Gren is the sun, and here, this figure here is Lu, actually Lu of the long arm and the silver hand. This image is not engraved on this rock. This image is engraved on another rock at Ridgecrest, another Celtic site. <laughs> but necessary for me to picture it here because it's the dynamic that goes on between the light being Bell and the shadow in this dynamic being Lug. And uh, this is my exact replication of the figure of Lug that was very neatly engraved um, high up on a rock at Ridgecrest. So that signifies entirely um, the summer solstice. In the winter solstice, the Navajo have the same thing. They call this the sky reaching rock. <clears throat> and that there is this lake at the top. And out of this lake is born the divinity born for water. He overflows and flow, flows down in a pool where coyote fishes him out. <clears throat> so it's the, it's the same, same thing that the Navajos evidently have something of the Celtic culture in their culture. Uh, so the lake is also called the body of the mind. And the closest lake to here, uh, where this river, the Truckee River flows, is actually Pyramid Lake. And Pyramid Lake certainly is a lake that would be the body of the mind. Uh, the name Azteca, Azteca, meaning first water, it is some of the oldest water on earth still. So then from that we will go here to this piece here. This is my sun shield. We're talking all about the sun today. And this is my sun shield and I take it out and I hold it up towards, you know, facing the sun to receive the energy from the sun. Now here in Native America, you know, we have a, you know, different cultural information. Uh, we view that the, the sun is a, an intelligent star that is receiving information from other stars. <clears throat> so this intelligent energy, you know, is totally capable of communicating you know, or conveying. So every morning when I meet the sun, I am, of course, receiving information from the star and all the stars that it knows. And I call this um, wordless information, but knowledge just the same. Go over here to this piece here. Uh, this is a Hopi rendition here. Uh, it's marvelous. It's hand painted by a Hopi artist, William Gale, here. And this depicts a son's house. And the meaning for this is that we enter in to son's house through our recessive natures into the blue and the black to find our higher natures in the red and the yellow. And I have been informed by this teaching for the past 60 years. And so this is again, you know, all marvelously hand painted. So that gives us all a good start on the sun. Now we can come over here to this. This is my figure for Mukha. We talked about him not too long ago. Uh, out here in the desert east of San Diego, it's variously called as a Borrego Desert, and, uh, Borrego Springs, and it goes all the way up to Palm Springs and 29 Palms and all that area. All of that is an area that has been lived in by people we are modernly calling the Kauia. Their proper name is the Motowita, uh, the original people or the cultured people. And we know by recent uh, archaeology near Palm Springs 
and the artifacts found there <laughs> that these people, Kui is the easy way to say it, um, have been living here for the past 8,000 years. So that's pretty remarkable. So that's where we are here, and this here is the creator, Mukok. Here I'm going to say, all cultures have something about the sun, one way or another, you know, how it, how it came about. Um, this one is, I find, very unique in the way the sun has come about. So we'll start with that. <clears throat> Here you see this is the white spider. When all of whatever the universe was, it was just you know dark. It was just dark with electrical charges going off, like you know lightning and so forth. <laughs> and in that, it showed up some silvery spider webs, is what they looked like. And then it appeared on those silvery spider webs something like spider eggs. And that spider eggs came from this white spider. And out of that spider eggs. Uh, hatched, you know, two characters, and that was Mukot and his brother, Timawea. <clears throat> and so that's who he was. But it didn't do much good once it came out because it couldn't see anything. It was so totally pitch dark. <clears throat> so Mukot and engendered his creative ability, and he created Muyak, the lizard. Here's the lizard. He created Muyak, the lizard. And Muyak, then swallowed all the darkness. And so now, instead of darkness, everything was light. It was all light. You could say the effulgence was everywhere. <clears throat> but it didn't have any specific you know, location or point to it. So Muya here, a very creative genius, that, uh, he reached down to the earth and he scooped up some glutinous clay and he you know, pushed it, pressed it you know, into, into his hand, into his fist. You know, he made that a good wad of this clay. And then he threw it. He threw it into this luminous blue sky. And it stuck. It stuck there. <clears throat> and then he took his index finger, his pointer finger there, and he pointed you know, to that blob of clay stuck in the sky and said, I will make you red. So he made it in red like that. Now making it red in the language also means to wake up. So it means we wake up with the sun. And down here, this artifact is uh, the forefinger of Mukot, reddened to make the sun red. And over here alongside of him, here, the lizard, uh, still here, he, this is his walking stick, this is Mukha's walking stick, and the lizard, uh, Moyak, still lives in his walking stick, so he's, he's always there. So, then we come over here to my next little scene here, again, we're mentioning the summer solstice on this one. This here, this is a pomegranate. It's getting a little bit old. And here is a, a Zuni pot. And here is, you know, the semblance of a kachina. And all this is talking about something that happened. <clears throat> uh, here in San Diego, the name Coronado is sprinkled all over the place. And as a Native American, I would say, unfortunately. <laughs> and for good reason, it's unfortunate. But what we have is that what the Americans are calling Zuni, this is a Pueblo located on uh, the eastern edge of Arizona, more on the New Mexico side. And the actual name of this Alona Ituana, meaning the center place. And this center place had also a Pueblo that was called Hawiku, which actually meant House of the Goddess. And there were some other Pueblos, you know, belonging to these people in the region, um, six, five or six in all. Now, Arizona Highways, you know, not too long ago, published a special glorifying Coronado as, quote, the first civilized man to enter into savage America. The whole article is, you know, completely bogus, 
to give it a nice word. <clears throat> um, the interest here is that the people living there are descendants of Berbers from North Africa. And Coronado well knew that, and he launched a huge expedition to go there. He knew where, who they were, he knew where they were. And this day that he arrived there was the summer solstice. And for the summer solstice, the priest had sprinkled cornmeal across the road. There was a road, unlike the illustrations in Arizona highways, this uh, road was uh, a 40 foot wide, almost paved, bermed road coming from the Salt Lake that the Spaniards themselves walked on up to the very visible Pueblo. The line of cornmeal meant that this was a sacred precinct because ceremonies were going on. And for somebody to disregard that and cross that, obviously, they had hostilities in mind, and hostilities did ensue. <clears throat> so the people were in, you know, whatever the celebration is. Here I use this, uh, probably a uh, Hopi. Um, these things, you know, like kachinas and things, were interchangeable uh, to people. They, they amount to, in our language, spiritual commodities, and we'll get to some of that later. So, you know, people, you know, bought spiritual things from other people, you know, and so forth. So that's why I have this here to show that there was, indeed, the kind of ceremonies going on that would be suitable for the uh, summer solstice. Now, of course, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, the Spaniards did all the bad things that they are renowned for, and uh, the people there have never forgot it. I was there a few years ago, and they certainly do not welcome Spaniards into their town. So, <laughs> and then what I'm getting at is that in Spain, the capital of the Berber people in Spain before 1492 is Granada. And Granada means pomegranate. And that's carried through with um, Duran. We'll get to Duran in the Celtic. This GR phoneme, and in Latin, it means seed. Basically, it means seed. <clears throat> so, Granada was the capital of the Berbers in Spain. And also, they had a building there that was called Alhambra, which was in the Red House. So the Spaniards, after they have subdued uh, the people of this Pueblo in their fashion, on their maps, they henceforth call this place Nuevo Granada. So that proves that they knew who these people were, and where they came from, and what they're doing. So. What the Americans call Zuni was what's called Nuevo Granada. And that's what we're having here. So if I can come up here to this here, this is something else that is Celtic, uh, or I could say Egyptian Celtic. At Pyramid Lake, there is a uh, huge uh, rock conglomerate covered with tufa, we call it. I made, this is a a picture of my painting. The painting is very large, and I've called it the uh, Sphinx of Pyramid Lake because from this view, it resembled a picture of the Egyptian Sphinx, and it has very much to do with the sun. It has the portrayal of Temu, the Egyptian Temu, and also of Ra, uh, the new sun. And in this particular instance that I'm illustrating here, uh, that's painted on the rock, uh, a little bit larger than my replication. This is the Egyptian cat goddess called Bast. And she's formed, these are uh, heat tweezers, you know, like you take coals out of the fire. That's her, her signature. And this is, you know, Hetne. This means this is the house of the moon, or hut of the moon. And what's happening, they're giving birth to the sun. And in my illustration, I don't have room for that, but over here on this side is the sun. There's a big crack right through here in the rock, and then 
to this side. In the rock itself, these were formed when the lake uh, was full, full of water and it formed you know, these, this kind of mineral rocks. There's a bubble, a big bubble, and that bubble had burst or been broken one way or the other, so it looked very much as if I took the skin off of this uh, actual fruit, pomegranate, <clears throat> and it looked just like that. And the person who painted this, you know, enhanced it by painting, you know, the broken skin on it red, and inside the granules of the rock looked very much and painted them red, so they looked like the seeds of the pomegranate. So we have an ancient conception here. The ancient conception is that the sun is full of seeds and that these seeds are in everything. And some Native American uh, groups and their language still retain that idea, you know, of, of the ignisis in everything. Uh, everything, everything in, in, in the world has sun seeds in it. So that's you know, very much a part of all of, of all this idea. And so when I can go down here to this figure here, this is from Egypt, since I'm talking about Egypt in this one. Uh, this is called Horus, Horus the, the falcon, or sometimes the hawk, like this. But this is an actual Egyptian product. Now he has very much to do with the sun. Uh, he's figured in all kinds of ways. The name Horus is a Greek name. Uh, the way it's written in Egyptian would be Hrys, like H-R-S, Hrys, which is rendered more like the face in the sky, like that. So uh, he's figured in all manners with the sun. And so uh, the way I'm, I'm putting it is the solar wind. Horus is the solar wind which is the continuous emanation of charged particles in all directions from the sun, which affects the magnetic fields of the planets in the star system. Uh, and that there are names for this force, the Nequia names Iva, Iva uh, or Prana, uh, and so forth. But it is the recognition of this force going on through the solar system, so we would say these way we say Horus is the personification of the solar wind. Now we come over here to this piece here. Uh, this is in Nevada. This is in a cave in Nevada. Uh, it is called Takime, uh, Takima Cave. It's in central Nevada, way up high up. And the cave is not a tunnel cave. It's more a very long, open cave. And up there it looks like you're on top of the world. You see the tops of all the other mountains. And it is thoroughly Celtic, written in Gaelic. And the whole cave, I don't know, it's pretty long. And it is totally full of Ogham writing. Totally. <clears throat> and I don't know what all of it says. But this part, which was closer to the beginning of the entry, uh, I could recognize. So to go back, being outside of the cave, you approach it, and here you see this uh, on the sloping rock, you know, to the entrance of the cave, is painted deer toes. These are the deer toes that it made to show this is the way it's inviting a person to enter into it. And this part that I could recognize, I thoroughly translate it. Uh, in this theme for the sun, I'm just really going to point out what is relevant for my theme. And that is that this is about grain. We already said, you know, grain, again, both the uh, phoneme, G-R for warm, and G-R for grain. And so, this is identifiable that these strokes are saying, you know, the letters of her name. And Gurian uh, or Shani are Celtic 
past Celtic informant, you know, said he pronounced it Grainer, Grainer. And here, this, this symbol here, Tiam, it says that this is a, a secret connection. Uh, that's what it says. This is a letter to Grant and different things that it's saying here. This is a very deep, very intimate letter that somebody wrote on the cave and the wall, the wall of the cave is very, very rough. So uh, to um, paint these on it was not as smooth as painting it on my flat uh, surface here. So, you know, this, this is a boat that's overturned to say, you know, bun skin, meaning deep love relation, or this here, this this is like a, an or, I say, you know, rame, meaning uh, this is also grun, uh, secret love. So all of th these things, and this is a being who inhabits the caves as a uh, centipede here, and she, she, you know, she inhabits all the, all the caves, and she is a messenger. Remember, she's the one who is going to mess take the message. And here, even this here, this is you know Buide, meaning this gold. This is the golden sun, and it's signing off the letter from thanks to her, thanks to Guren, to Guren. Um, It's also called you know hedgehog because of the bristles, and the hedgehog was a sacred animal of the um, ancient goddess culture here. And uh, here, this, this line in here is boenic, you know, it means uh, I will make a vow to Grand. That's what this is saying. So that goes on, you know, all that way. So just to give you an idea, I'm not going to do all the translation on this talk today. But then we're going to go right over here next to it. Now, this is a very small a rendition that I've made here. This is Okhmakran. Okhmakran means he is the son of Guren. Uh, he's also called Sunny Face because he invented the Ogham writing, which is all these strokes. And here, at uh, the end of his arm is his name written as G, G M, G M, or Ogma. And he learned this in his myth by looking into the face of the sun. And looking into the face of the sun, he saw the eyelashes of Guren. And so that's what his head is formed here. These are her eyelashes. And from her eyelashes, he learned this system we're calling the Ogam here. And so he is also, he's a Maksavul. He is a Maksavul, meaning he, he is her, her son. And here's a little Celtic prayer to go along with him. To the Sun Lord, Ogma, to you be a hailing, the blessing of Kram Kruak, stone and thunder. Both of them be upon you and both plains and hills give again blessing. And here are birds and bees, the feathered and insect worlds, and luxuriance of growth, and the seven days, and the heaven of stars, the air and the ether above it. May fish in the water bless you. May sand and soil bless you. May you be blessed by deeds following thoughts. So may he who has done good praise you. So may I too bless you, Ogma, Sun Lord, all hail, all hail. So that is an authentic Celtic uh, prayer, if we were going to call it. And I learned these things from Shani and the way that he can say these things in that Celtic tone is nothing like what I can do. So. <laughs> Now we're coming to uh, Mexico. I'm trying to hit on these places that where the sun, you know, definitely, you know, was very outstanding. Oh, while I'm here, I should just say, look at here. You look, this this is, is the buffalo. Now here in Native America, uh, the buffalo is the principle of sustenance, and what makes it the principle of sustenance is the sun. 
the sun is in the buffalo. Now, when the Europeans came here, they didn't like anybody uh, here. They didn't like any animals. They didn't like anything. They didn't like anything here. It's not the, the way it's supposed to be for them. So they thought of killing all the animals. Imagine that. Who could think of something like that? <clears throat> and so they you know, then went on to think they were going to kill all the buffalo. But we know the buffalo never dies because while you might think of killing all the animals, you certainly can't rub out the sun. And so we do know that the sun still lives, and there still is the buffalo who never dies. And he's coming back ever stronger. So we definitely want to say about that. And I will be following, after this week, uh, the advent of the white, great white buffalo constellation here. So we do have that. Now let us you know, go to Mexico. Mexico is another famous place about the sun. Uh, just to get a footnote here, this little figure I got in Mexico at Teotihuacan is also the site of the Sun Pyramid. So just that we have, you know, a start there. <clears throat> and here, this is to represent a maca or scarlet maca. Now maca definitely was a very, he's very ancient, he's still very powerful but very uh, ancient, um, we call him deity or, or something like, like that. Uh, he could e have even been a son. Now the Aztecs, the people were calling Aztecs in their civilized form, I mean civilized form, you know, metropolitan form, uh, they were kind of uh, late comers. They didn't really last very long, less than a hundred years before the Spaniards stamped them out. Uh, but they did, you know, inherit things from uh, earlier people and they put it in an arrangement, and what I'm talking about is suns. Kind of like saying their history of the earth or the world was five suns. I remember the first sun was a jaguar, and it kind of made a lot of jaguars that ate up everybody. Uh, then one was a fire, and it burned up everybody. And uh, I like the fourth one. The fourth one was water, and water was really a goddess. And that was a really, I thought that was a really good time to be in her world because everybody were fish. So that was really, really good. But then came the fifth sun, and the fifth sun was the time, I think maybe we're still in it. And uh, because uh, Claudia and I had attended a Hopi ceremony several years ago where they're, they're talking about, you know, the fifth world, you know. Uh, something's going on in the fifth world. So the fifth world is now the fifth sun and it's actually called Oyen, Oyen, which means movement or means motion. And there's, we go to the museum in Mexico City and you walk in, you'll see this huge, huge stone um, disc, as, as it is, it must weigh tons, and it's called the calendar sun, stone, the color stone. And in the center of it is, is the, the main guy, the guy who is the fifth son, Odin. And Olin also means earthquake, so they kind of figured uh, the world was going to end with earthquakes, but maybe they didn't interpret it right, because motion is still motion. So, all of that. So then we come here to uh, this Maka. He has different name. It's it's some yay. Uh, he's glorious, or uh, I know him as Gukomats, uh, or he's called Seven Seven Maka. Uh, I got some things on that. I get there. So this is what one actually from the Popo rule. He's saying, he there, he's saying, I am great, I am the sun, I am their light. My light is great because my eyes are made of metal and my teeth glitter as jewels of turquoise. They stand out blue with stones like the face of the sky." So, that's an ancient piece here. And here's another piece, uh, kind of like a song, Maka. Cree, 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 my feathers, my feathers, long feathers, long feathers. Cree, 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 colors me, colors me. Green body, green body, cree, 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 red wings spreading, red 
wings spreading. Wind holds me, wind holds me. Cree, cree, cree. Eye skies, eye skies. Tree to see, tree to see. Cree, cree, cree. Wet my feathers, wet my feathers. Beautiful rain, beautiful rain. Cree, cree, cree. So these are introductions to this uh, wonderful character. Uh, this here, this is actual Makha tail feather. Now the, the ancient priests, or were the priests of the Aztecs, you know, like that, uh, with his feathers, they would wave these feathers, you know, to the sun to whisk, whisk away the clouds. You know, so this, you know, is, is actually, you know, a, a sun duster. <laughs> you know, get away, get away from the sun. You know, want the, want the sun uh, here. Now we're, I have a little turquoise bowl. This is a, a Zuni turquoise uh, medicine bowl, so what do you call it, with little figures around it and a turquoise nugget. So I can go up here, up here. <laughs> this is a turquoise guy, <laughs> turquoise man. Uh, some of the deities are born with turquoise in them. So this, you know, has a little bit of a story. Over there in Arizona, there's a big house, what we call this big house, Casa Grande, uh, the Pima, the Pima, you know what, uh, and so the, the chief, of, the chief of this big house, the chief was called, you know, Morning Green, and he had a couple of daughters, and the daughters, you know, were kind of, you know, uh, scouting around, scouting around out there in the Arizona land, and they discovered a mine of turquoise stones beautiful turquoise stones, and they came back and they told their father, the chief, but from there, you know, the news spread, you know, spread pretty pretty fast and far, and spread all the way over to the the sun goddess, the sun woman in the east, that's where her name was, the sun in the east, like that, and so she heard about that, and that certainly whet her appetite, so she sent her Maka parent, the guy he looks just like SMA here, I'm going to pair it up here, and and said, you know, go and, and get me some of those beautiful stones, turquoise stones. So he flew over there, and when he arrived there, where these girls were, uh, yeah, was a very attractive, important fellow, but they didn't really know what, what did he want like that. So they made different offerings to him, and he just shook his head, no, no I'm not interested, I'm not interested. So finally, you know, they made a, a you know a bowl of mush hatoli, like that, and they put a turquoise bead in it, and they offered it to the boy. He swallowed that turquoise bead up right away. So they got the idea. So they kept giving him a little bit more turquoise beads, and he gulped them down and gulped them down. And when his gullet was full, he left them and flew back, you know, to the sun goddess, the sun in the east, like that. <clears throat> and so that you know started this whole thing again. We're talking about spiritual commodities. And this, evidently, the story is how we begin the relation between the Maka and the turquoise, because the Makas live farther south in Mexico. Uh, they don't live up here by Arizona, not naturally. So, you know, to trade turquoise to the people in the south and get Makas to the people in the north, you know, took, you know, some, you know, real engineering and cultivation, but that, you know, is how that the two uh, got together. The other thing while we're up here, you see this here? This is a, an old copper bell. Um, now the people there in Mexico, Central America, they did somehow learn how to, you know, uh, how do you say, smelt uh, metal. Copper, I guess, is not too hard to get and so forth. Uh, so they did. They, they, they did uh, make some things out of metal. Um, little things, little things. And among them, these copper bells, they're called Tears of the Sun. Tears of the Sun. And uh, people who impersonate the divinities, you know, with their masks and costumes, and they're, they're going to wear these bells, you know, so they will jingle, jingle when they go along. So all in all, you know, it's, it's an attribute of the sun, and any of the divinities, Quetzalcoatl or any of them, 
who are also figured in the Mexican pantheon, they can move these qualities around uh, quite a bit, quite a bit, you know. So one guy can put on another guy's mask and things like that. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, but a standard was, you know, these bells like that so that they could uh, always be uh, beautiful, uh, always be uh, transferred as we're saying. Now what did, what did they mean? Well, it, it's evident that what they stood for was fertility, fertility and regeneration. Now, again, we, we reckon that these civilizations in Mexico were agriculturalists, basically. They, they grew corn and things like that. So they were very interested in uh, enticing the sun to uh, fertilize their country. And so that's what we, we have you know, there for that. Let me here read a little piece that is from old Mexico. I'll read the English part of it. The sun, eagle, dart of fire, prince of the year, illuminates, make things glow, lights them with its rays, is warm, burns people, makes them perspire, turns dark the complexion of people, blackens them, makes them black as the night. So in case you notice the complexion of people who live to the south. I'm going to finish here with uh, Mary Oliver. I haven't heard from her for a while. And this is, this is one that is um, definitely for the uh, solstice. She titles it Stories. Do you know the old stories? about the stars, the hunter, and dog, swan, crab, dragon, lion, big bear, and little bear, the seven sisters there on the horizon. Call it pleasure. Call it comfort. Call it rinsing out the dread all night long. The silence of the heavens remains intractable. The darkness is more dark than the black, than the back of the moon's silver eye, and heavy as lead. This is why there are so many stories to draw each star into the mouth for a single minute, to feel that white fire against the teeth, bearable, even intimate. What happens next? We say, what happens next? And why does it happen? And what happens then? Because that has happened. Lifting up the darkness by that much, the sun shone. Thank you, folks. <laughs>